Cavalcade of Kings. George the Third, Part One. The cavalcade of kings rides on. George the Second has passed, and his grandson George the Third approaches. He was born at Norfolk House in James Square, London, on the 4th of June, 1738, and was the son of Frederick Lewis, Prince of Wales, his mother being Augusta, daughter of the Duke of Saxe Gotha. It is significant that in an age of luxury and extravagance, George was simple. In an age of unrest, he was steadfast. And in an age of licentiousness, he was full of domestic virtues. Though not a drop of English blood ran in his veins, George III was a typical, intensely patriotic Englishman. His reign was marked by many vicissitudes, and it extended over 60 years. Decisive battles were fought in America, India, and Europe, and many grand conquests achieved. Great statesmen such as Pitt and Fox adorned it, and men such as Nelson and Wellington made their names famous during its course. It is now October the 25th, 1760, and we find young Prince George with a party of friends. Continuing the subject we were discussing at breakfast, Your Highness, I still affirm that as children, our acting ability was far better than that of some of the professional adult actors we listen to today. Does Your Highness remember how we portrayed the characters in Cato? <laughs> <laughs> I'll wager a hundred crowns that not one of us could remember a single line of our parts if our lives depended upon it. I'll take you not. Now listen, and I'll recite the prologue to Cato, which was written for me to speak by my Lord Earl of Butte. Bravo. 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 To speak with freedom, dignity, and ease, to learn those arts which may hereafter please, rehearse the poet's labours on the stage. Nay more, a nobler end is still behind. The poet's labours elevate the mind, teach our young hearts with generous fire to burn, and feel the virtuous sentiment we learn. To attain these glorious ends, what play so fit as that where all the powers of human wit combine to dignify great Cato's name, to deck his tomb, and consecrate his fame? <laughs> <laughs> there you are. You owe me a hundred crowns, my lord. No, it was worth much more to hear your highness speak those dear familiar lines, which we pondered over but could never quite comprehend when we were children. <laughs> aye, aye. A messenger from his majesty the king. Admit him. Your highness. Highness. Yes? What news have you, messenger? Highness, I am the bearer of grave tidings. Your grandfather, the king... Speak on, man, speak on. Highness, his majesty has been seized by an illness which threatens to be fatal. What? This can't be true. No, it's impossible. I trust nothing untoward has happened, Highness. My lords, we must hence post haste to London. The king has of a sudden been stricken with an illness which his messenger views with extreme gravity. <laughs> While on the road, the royal party of horsemen were met by the coach of Mr. Pitt, who had hurriedly left London bringing tidings of the death of George II, and to formally convey the intelligence of the young prince's accession to the throne. George, now King George III, entered the coach of the Secretary of State, and silently they drove to Savile House, where later we find the new king surrounded by his courtiers. At the moment, His Majesty is conversing with the Earl of Bute. Well, understand your majesty's distress of mind. The blow fell with such unexpected suddenness. Death is the great leveller, my lord Earl of Butte. It respects neither prince nor pauper. It strikes as fate decrees. I pray to God that I shall be strong enough to carry the burden of responsibility which has so suddenly fallen upon my very immature shoulders. If I have the loyalty and cooperation of my ministers, I should succeed. But I fear me we are living in a society from which the great factor of sincerity has been withdrawn. Your faith is a deplorable time, Your Majesty. Religion and morality are at their lowest ebb. Society is decadent, licentious, abominable. The cause of our moral decay is hard to define. It is like that which preceded the fall of the Roman Empire. The increase of commerce, population in the towns, unaccompanied by any religious or educational advancement, is partially responsible. The people are half-starved, violence is rife, 
And although thieves are brutally hanged by the dozens, yet so desperate are the lower classes that they callously brave death in order to rob their more fortunate neighbors of the common necessities of life. There is but one remedy as I view it. We must tear out the present social system root and branch and substitute simplicity for gross extravagance, steadfastness for unrest, religion and education for moral turpitude and ignorance. I shall deem it an honor to serve your majesty to this end. Thank you, my lord Earl. Oh, sire, forgive this intrusion, but your counselors await you. I am ready, my lord Duke of Newcastle. Oh, sire, before we proceed to the council chamber, may I take this opportunity of pledging my loyalty, my sword and my life, to the service of my royal master, King George III, and to kiss his blessed hand as I kneel in homage to him. Thank you, your grace. There are great difficulties lying before us, but with loyalty, courage, and perseverance, we shall overcome them and earn the blessings of the people in whose name I rule this glorious kingdom. I am the king's man, sire. And I am deeply touched by your expression of loyalty, your grace, which I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And now let us attend to immediate needs. Mr. Pitt and my ministers await my presence. I must join them at once. <laughs> I trust your majesty will pardon this intrusion into his hour of grief, but the urgency of our business makes it necessary. I quite understand, Mr. Pitt. No apology is needed, I assure you. The grace of your kingly courage, sire, is as a mantle of gold which sets nobly upon your majesty's youthful shoulders. Mr. Pitt, spare me your eloquent flattery, I pray you. Let us proceed with our business. You have but to command, sire. As Secretary of State, I have prepared a paper outlining the speech which will be most proper for your majesty to repeat to the Privy Council. I have... Your paper will not be necessary, Mr. Pitt. I have previously viewed the subject and have myself already prepared my speech to my Privy Council. In being overzealous, I had forgotten for the moment your majesty's well-known gift of oratory. I crave pardon for my lapse, sir. Your glibness savors of insincerity, Mr. Pitt. I like it not. Pray excuse me. Come, my Lord Elifute. Please attend me to the council table. My lords, the loss that I and the nation have sustained by the death of the king, my grandfather, would have been severely felt at any time. But coming at so critical a juncture and so unexpected, it is by many circumstances augmented, and the weight now fallen on me much increased. I feel my own insufficiency to support it as I wish, but animated by the tenderest affection for my native country, and depending on the advice, experience, and ability of your lordships, and the support of every honest man, I enter with cheerfulness into this arduous situation. <laughs> Born and educated in this country, I glory in the name of Britain, and the peculiar happiness of my life will ever consist in promoting the welfare of a people whose loyalty and warm affection to me I consider the greatest and most permanent security of my throne. Later we find His Majesty bidding farewell to Hannah Lightfoot, a beautiful young Quakeress with whom, as Prince of Wales, he had been madly in love. To me, our romance has been a very beautiful thing, sire. I shall always cherish the memory of it as a sweet perfume of the past. Hannah, you speak so irrevocably. Do you mean that this is to be the end of everything between us? Yes, sire. I thought you loved me. I do love you with all my being, and I shall go on caring till the end. Oh, my dear, my dear, can't you see there is no other way but to part? You are the king of a great and mighty nation. In the life of such an exalted personage as you... There is no place for one so lowly as I, except as your mistress. No, don't utter that odious word, Ashley. But we must face back, sire. We could never marry. To do so would rouse the bitterest antagonism of your ministers towards me, a condition which I could not bear with equanimity. There would be turmoil, strife, and discontent. Neither you nor I would know a moment's peace. And love, 
being the delicate thing it is, would die between us. No, my beloved, to part now, still retaining our mutual respect and regard, is far the better thing to do. Goodbye, my dear one. Hannah, I can't. Oh, I Please can't. don't make it harder for me. I've prayed night and day for courage to meet this, this moment bravely. Help me not to weaken, please. Oh, please help me, George, to, to give you back to, to England. <laughs> As you will, my beloved. <laughs> Goodbye, and God keep you always. Yeah.